on Jerusalem Dateline. This week on Jerusalem Dateline, made in Israel. It was just this country with incredible dynamism and energy and excitement and food and people and a sense of family and ultimately a sense of belonging. How a plot of dirt in the desert turned into the land of milk and honey. See how this tiny country is feeding the world. Hello and welcome to this special edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. Billionaire investor Warren Buffett once called Israel the most promising investment hub outside of the United States. Per capita, the Jewish state has produced more cutting-edge technologies than any other country on Earth. Today, we'll look at how technology in agriculture is making the desert bloom in Israel and around the world. In 1867, Mark Twain toured the land of Israel, known back then as Palestine. Here's how he described it. A desolate country whose soil is rich enough, but is given over wholly to weeds a silent, mournful expanse. There was hardly a tree or a shrub anywhere. Palestine sits in sackcloth and ashes, desolate and unlovely. Today, Mark Twain wouldn't even recognize this land. Out of rocky soil, out of swamps, and even out of deserts, Israelis have created gardens, vineyards, and farms with some of the most innovative techniques in the world. It was just this country with incredible dynamism and energy and excitement and food and people and a sense of family and ultimately a sense of belonging. It's been said that the modern state of Israel was born on the kibbutz. So it's only natural that much of Israel's innovation was born there as well. The kibbutz is the cornerstone in a lot of ways of a lot of things in Israeli society. People came back wanting to create a collective and an equal society. And these kibbutzim became a very, very effective way to defend the land, to start getting young people engaged in agriculture. Remember, Jews were forbidden in most countries of the world to actually own land or to work the land. Jews couldn't be farmers. To all of a sudden see a generation of Jews farming the land in a collective environment, it was, it was incredible. Before Israel even became a state, Jews by the thousands came to live there on communal farms. But when they arrived in the Promised Land, it wasn't exactly flowing with milk and honey. The coastal plains were swampy, the Galilee and the Judean hills were rocky, and the southern half of the country was mostly desert. Since the people of Israel left our homeland 2,000 years ago, the area was mismanaged. So we want to preserve and rehabilitate this holy land. The early Jewish settlers faced a number of obstacles, from bad soil to Bedouin raiders. But they faced an even bigger enemy that threatened to destroy the Jewish state before it began. In the early decades of the 20th century, Israel was a breeding ground for mosquitoes carrying malaria. They overtook the coastal plains and the Jordan Valley, the only land available for Jews to buy since the local Arabs had decided it was uninhabitable. In 1920, more than a third of all Jewish residents of Palestine had malaria. So with no other choice, they went to work. They drained the swamps and sprayed the land and changed the flow of water in irrigation canals to interrupt the mosquitoes' breeding. They were so successful that a commission from the League of Nations visited Palestine to learn what they did. Less than 20 years after Israel's statehood, the country was officially malaria-free. Once the threat of malaria was gone, Jewish settlers were free to focus on making the desert bloom. In the coastal plains, citrus groves replaced the swamps. In the Jordan Valley, once the center of the malaria epidemic, now became the country's breadbasket. The Negev Desert blossomed with newly planted forests and vineyards. And the Arava, once the most arid part of Israel, became the site of a flourishing vegetable industry. All of this was accomplished in the first 20 years of Israel's statehood. In that time, they more than doubled their standard of living. And now they're using their experience to help other countries. 
In the 1970s, they created a new breed of cherry tomato that's disease resistant and has a longer shelf life. They also bred a new kind of potato that can be grown in hot, dry climates and irrigated by salt water. These vegetables are now being grown in dry countries like Jordan, Egypt, and Morocco. Israeli scientists not only found ways to grow more crops, they also found new ways to preserve them. Grain Pro cocoons provide an inexpensive way for farmers to keep their grain market fresh by keeping out water, air, and insects. The Israeli cocoons are being used in Africa, the Far East, and even Pakistan, a nation with no diplomatic ties to Israel. Up next, exporting Israeli ingenuity. See how Israel's creative solutions for fighting pests and growing crops are now helping the world. Israeli innovation has brought the deserts to life, cultivating crops from wasteland. Israel's agricultural solutions began decades ago on small Jewish farms. But now they've gone global, exported from the kibbutz to bless the world. Here's CBN's Gordon Robertson with more of our report. The kibbutz over time began to change. Israeli society began to change, became more capitalistic, became more focused on free enterprise and entrepreneurship and then the individual taking responsibility for himself and therefore benefiting the overall society. There have been many very exciting companies that have been built in kibbutzim. One of those companies is now doing business around the world. He went to the average Israeli 10, 12 years ago and said to them, organic, they wouldn't have a clue what you were talking about. Here we've been doing organic farming for over 40 years. Kibbutz Ste Eliyahu was founded by German refugees in 1934, and many of their early members were survivors of the Holocaust. So the biggest problem that we had when we started the organic was, what do you do if you're not using chemicals? How do you get rid of the pests? Their answer was to fight bugs with more bugs. Every single thing in nature has a natural enemy. What eats or what attacks these pests that are attacking our crops? They started breeding different insects in the bomb shelter of the kibbutz. The idea was to breed predators to destroy the pests that ate their crops. The result was a new company called BioBee. We went to the Israeli farmers. We said, you want to buy some bugs? They said, what are you, crazy? <laughs> we don't have enough bugs in the field. You want us to buy bugs? Eventually, they won over farmers in Israel and in 32 other countries as well. In California, 60% of the strawberry fields are treated with products from BioBee. The company also found a way to deal with one of the region's most devastating insects, the Mediterranean fruit fly. We take the males of the species and we sterilize them. And then we release the sterile males into the environment. There's no future generation. And slowly, slowly, we lower the population without using harmful chemicals. They also solved another agricultural problem, how to pollinate greenhouse plants. The classic example we like to give is, is tomato plants. Tomato plants in, the, in nature, in the fields, are pollinated by the wind. In Israel, the majority of our tomatoes are not grown in the fields, they're grown in greenhouses. And in greenhouse, in a climate-controlled environment, you don't have that wind, you don't have the natural pollination. We had to find other methods of pollination. Their solution was to breed bumblebees. They collect pollen for food. They have to go and work even in cold weather conditions. They don't have stores of honey in the hive. They have to go and work. We're saving the farmer money because instead of paying people, the bees are doing the work. And the bees, unlike people, they don't miss a single flower. So once the farmers started using the bees for pollination, the yield of the tomato crops increased by 25%. In Hebrew, we say, Marabuma Sechelokim, you know, how great and wonderful are your creations, uh, God. And this really shows that every single thing has a reason. There's a purpose for everything, these tiny little things. And look how much good they do for us, for the world, for the farmers, for the environment. It's really, really amazing. We're a light unto the nations. We're supposed to be anyways. If we want to really save the environment, if we really want to help the world, then we can't keep these things to ourselves. We have to share these things. We have to share this knowledge. And I think by helping others, we're helping ourselves as well. 
coming up. Moses had to strike a rock to get it. But today in Israel, water can go from the ocean to the faucet in less than 90 minutes. See how Israelis are creating streams in the desert after this. For the past 65 years, one of Israel's biggest challenges has been a chronic water shortage. But this year, for the first time in modern history, the nation's water authority declared that Israel has officially beat the drought. And, in fact, that Israelis may soon have a water surplus. Here's a look at the innovative techniques that have helped boost Israel's water supply. More than half of this country's land is desert. And we have a severe water shortage. Moses led us to Israel, a country that has no oil, no water, not uh, too good soil. And we had to make the best out of it. Thousands of years ago, Moses had to strike a rock to get water in the desert. Well, today Israelis are taking a slightly different approach using technology and creativity. In Israel, the main sources of drinking water are the Sea of Galilee and two underground aquifers. If rainfall is short, so is the nation's water supply. In 1953, Israel started building the National Water Carrier, a system of pipelines, canals, and reservoirs to carry water from the Sea of Galilee to the rest of Israel. So we didn't have water? Okay, we developed water technology. One of the things that Israel has excelled in is taking what some people would see as risk factors or as curses and turning them into blessings. From the time of Bil'am, the Jewish people have always been able to somehow turn the curse into a blessing. The pipelines were a good start. But Israel's fresh water supply wasn't enough to support a growing country. So Israelis started looking west to the Mediterranean. For thousands of years, the Mediterranean Sea was the center of the ancient world, the crossroads between Europe, Asia, and Africa. And now it's one of Israel's greatest natural resources. Israel is desalinating so much of its drinking water, the majority of our drinking water's origin will be the Mediterranean Sea by the end of next year. Today, Israel produces 450 million cubic meters of drinkable water a day. Through a process called seawater reverse osmosis, water can go from the ocean to the faucet in less than 90 minutes. The Israeli technology is now used in more than 40 countries around the world. And thanks to the Mediterranean, Israel may soon have something that was once unthinkable, a water surplus. In this country, we don't have much water, except somehow, by the end of this decade, Israel is going to become a net water exporter. Just on today's news, there was an item about how Israel is stepping up the export of water to Jordan in order to supply water for all the Syrian refugees who are fleeing into Jordan. While Israel produces drinking water from the sea, many farmers are getting water for their crops literally out of thin air. Ancient Israelites used stones to collect the dew every morning. Now an Israeli company is using plastic trays to do the same. The trays were developed by Talyad Technologies, which means God's dew in Hebrew. Every morning, these trays channel the dew straight into the roots of the plants. They also prevent weeds from growing between the plants and reduce water usage by up to 50%. Israeli farmers have always made good use of their water. But it wasn't long before they realized that in order to survive, they also needed to start reusing it. Today, Israel recycles 80% of its wastewater. The closest competitor is Spain with 10%. So we recycle more than eight times more water than any other country on the planet. Israelis developed a way to purify wastewater using ultraviolet light. This treated water is then used to irrigate crops. 
If you use it for vegetables, then you would like to clean it to the extent that you can almost drink it. So it is treated to a very high degree. Today, 60% of the water that is irrigating fields in Israel is produced water and not natural water. And I'll give you an example of our farm here on the kibbutz. We grow jojoba and we use only sewage water, only treated wastewater to irrigate our jojoba. And this is done all over Israel. Up next, from wastewater to saltwater, how Israel's turning curses into blessings. The conclusion of our report on Israel's innovative methods for using water. More than half of Israel is desert. That means the lack of clean water is a life or death issue. But Israel has done so well at cleansing water through methods like desalination and recycling that they're exporting their ideas to help other struggling countries. CBN's Gordon Robertson has the conclusion to this report. Israel may be short on fresh water, but the country's Negev desert is sitting on an underground ocean, too salty to drink or desalinate. So Israeli settlers found a new way to use it. You cannot really fight nature. Nature will fight you back. We found out after the years that it's better to cooperate and to coordinate with what you've got. Yoav Dagan is one of a growing number of Israelis who have left the ocean to go fishing in the desert. They build fish farms using the warm, salty water from underground. It's ideal for raising saltwater fish like tilapia, sea bass, and barramundi. The place here is working without chemicals, without anything. It's very healthy, it's friendly for the environment. And it's good for us in a matter of the pocket. We are making good money, and this is uh, by the bottom line. At this kibbutz in the Negev Desert, even the fish waste is put to use. Every week, the water in these tanks is replaced and pumped underground to irrigate the nearby olive grove. The fish waste in the water makes an ideal natural fertilizer. As you can see on the side, the olives are growing around the farm, around the fish and are doing very well without any other chemicals, only by the nutrients of the fish. Israel has taken this idea to other countries, struggling with water and food shortages. We're taking African villages, teaching them how to essentially build fish farms. If you look at around Lake Victoria, the Nile perch were dying. And Israelis are now going in to teach the farmers how to grow them in ponds so that you can actually continue to eat the Nile perch. Over the years, Israelis also found new ways to use less water. And as always, they started in the desert. There's the story of the Arava. Sometimes as 20 millimeters of rain annual fall, very harsh climate, and still, thanks to drip irrigation, this became the vegetable barn of Israel. 65% of vegetable export out of Israel, mainly to Europe, is coming from the Arava. Today, even the driest parts of the desert are blooming, with help from a process called drip irrigation. The idea is older than the state of Israel itself. When the first settlers came here, Young people came from the city and they wanted to be farmers. And they came to Kibbutz Chatzirim and they faced many challenges. Arid land, high salinity, not enough water. And there was even a time when they considered moving to another place. But then Ben Gurion came, who was a leader with a real vision, and he said, guys, if you want to move, it's okay, but further south, not back to the north. And we stayed here and we continued and we did some experiment, but still we were struggling. Then we met the guy who invented drip irrigation. That guy was an engineer named Simka Blas. He got the idea for drip irrigation after seeing a tree that was larger than the others around it. After digging around the roots, 
he found it was being watered by a leak in an underground pipe. So this gave him the idea, but it took him some years, actually, until a plastic was introduced to start and, and make experiments with drippers that will emit water in small drops. And this is basically drip irrigation. Bloss met the farmers of Kibbutz Hatzarin, and together they started a company called Netafim, which means drops of water in Hebrew. Soon they boosted their crop yield by 50% and used 40% less water to do it. Drip irrigation saves a lot of water, producing more, getting more, yet not harming the environment. For almost half a century, the company has lived up to its slogan, grow more with less, not just in Israel, but in 110 countries around the world, from sugarcane fields in the Philippines to tea plantations in Tanzania. You know, India is now our number one country. The results, looking at the yield increase, were amazing. 50% of the farmers got an increase in yield between 25 and 50%. Another 25% of the farmers got an increase in yield of up to 75%. Everyone is talking about water scarcity. 70% of the water that we have available in the world is used for agriculture. Now, if we save only 15% in agriculture, we can more than double the available water for drinking and sanitation. In Hebrew, we have a, a, a term which is called tikkun olam, which is fixing the world. And this is basically what drip irrigation does. This is my personal goal and challenge. That's all for this week. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.